I just looked at it as I want to be one of the best basketball players who've ever played. That's the end goal. Okay, how do I get there? How do I get there? And every decision I made in my life was centered around the process of helping me eventually get there. Just talk about staying in that zone and how you were able to maintain yeah, that. It's, it's hard, man. You know, there's times where you come out of it, and um, even myself, when I'd come out of it, I'd, I'd be aware of bringing myself right back, right? Because sometimes you have those emo emotional outbursts, right? But then you got to find that center again because the, the next play is imminent. You're here, right? So the most important thing is really staying in the moment and staying present. I mean, that's all the zone is. You know, whether it's offensive and being in the zone or defensive being in the zone, what that really means is that you're simply here in the present, and the only thing that matters is what's right in front of you. And the trick is how do you do that? Yeah, well, Phil introduced meditation to us when he came uh, to our team in 99, 2000. And um, it was something that I instantly gravitated to because I could see the effects. Right? You, and I used to watch, you know, studying the games, the Bulls teams. And... Um, you know, watching their demeanor, watching their composure, you know, playing in a tough place in like Utah, doing the finals and being down 17. But everybody was like this. You couldn't tell if they were down 17 or up 20 or a tie game and never changed. And I was wondering why the hell that is. And that's when I started doing more research. And when Phil came, I immediately gravitated to it and then found myself accepting the challenge of finding what that space is. And for the 81 point game, man, to be honest, I, was, I wasn't even thinking about the game. My knee was hurting so much. Um, I didn't know then, but you know, I had a flap of joint, uh, a cartilage stuck in my joint line. And so my mind was really trying to go to a place where I don't feel that pain. And uh, the game started, and because of that, I was just in a different space. You know, I wasn't worried about what was to come. I wasn't worried about what just happened. I was just here. And when you're just there in the moment, playing plays right in front of you, your focus is heightened because nothing else matters. Um, and uh, that's the space I've tried to get to. I meditate every day. I meditate every day. And um, I do it in the mornings. And uh, I do it for about 10 to 15 minutes. And uh, I, I think it's important because it just, it, it, it sets me up for the rest of the day. You know, it helps me. It's like, it's like, it's like having an anchor. You know, it's, it's, um, if I don't do it, I feel like I'm constantly chasing the day as opposed to being able to be controlled and dictate the day. Not that you're you know, calling the shots on what comes forward, but the fact that I am set and ready for whatever may come my way. You know, I have a calmness about whatever comes my way and a poise. Um, and that comes from starting the morning off with meditation. Before you start a game, how can you lock in and get into that mental space where nothing else matters. You're completely locked in and focused on what you're trying to accomplish as an athlete out here. The noise of the crowd doesn't matter. Whether the cheering or booing doesn't matter. You're just completely locked in. How do you do that? I bought into the meditation. I bought into the deeper connection that exists within the game. And so when you watch our teams, or you watch any of Phil's teams, or Chicago teams, game six against Utah, you watch our games, you know, game seven against Boston, we were never rattled, ever because we're always in the moment, always in the present, always extremely calm, always looking at the reality of the situation and not letting our emotions cloud our execution. And that comes from being in that meditative state that he would teach and preach from day one. 11 point lead right now for the Lakers, final minute third, Brian, don't go, dunk in the board. I felt good, I hate when shots feel good and they don't go in. You gotta just tweak it. You forget about it, go into the next play. Yeah, I don't dwell on missed shots at all. I don't think about that stuff. Very, very optimistic. If I miss five in a row, that means I'm due for the sixth one. If I miss the sixth one, that means I'm definitely due for the seventh one. If I miss the seventh one, that means that, that eighth one's going in. <laughs>
tonight it got the best of me. You know, I, I was, I wanted it so bad. And sometimes you want something so bad it slips away from you. And uh, my guys picked me up. I mean, I can't, I can't say enough about the Spaniard. But that guy, that guy's unbelievable and just a hell of a player. And uh, we wouldn't have won it without him. I'm like, I know when I'm effing up. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, like, I, 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 I can, I can sit there in the locker room and just relax and collect myself. You know, I, I think, you know, one of Phil's um, great attributes is that he knows when players need to hear something when they don't. And when they don't, he'll give you your space. And he knows how bad I wanted this. You know, but the problem was I wanted it too much and I was exhausted. So it was just like, you know, it was a no-win situation. I, mean, I had I caught a ball at the top of the key late in the fourth quarter and just, just lost. I mean, just stuff mm -hmm. like that. So when that happens, you got to try to step back, relax, and uh, let the things flow. What I, you have to understand is that those pressures are self-inflicted. They're self-made. It's, it's the imagination. So you have to be able to control your mind and understand exactly that pressure does not exist. It's, it does not exist. We create pressure ourselves. Whether somebody's watching or somebody's not watching, whether you make it or whether you miss it, you're going to get up the next day and you're going to learn and you're going to do it all over again. The cycle's just going to keep coming, whether you make it or miss it. So why worry about it? That's doing too much. This is a dumb play by me. My boy, Al, what you make? <laughs> That's just a dumb play. Should have laid the ball up. Damn it. It's, it's fun. All this is, it's, it's, it's fun to me. There's no pressure in it. There's no fear. A lot of guys, I, I think, when they match up with other great players, there's a fear of embarrassment. You know, to guard them. Afraid that they might look, make you look bad. I really don't care. It's just fun going up against them. If you're playing a great player, of course it's going to make you look bad sometimes, but that's part of the game. It is what it is. Um, we, first of all, when you try to block something out, it, it, you just, you're just telling yourself to you're just bring more attention, attention to it <laughs> by saying, don't think about this, don't think about that. You're going to think about it anyway. Um, so what I try to do is I embrace it. I embrace it. You know, it's like a, it's like a cloud passing in the night, man. And you see it, it comes to you, and then it just, there it goes, right? So when I have distractions or you know, media requests or whatever the case may be, I see it, I recognize it, I understand it's there, now I let it go, right? So it's this constant cycle of things that happen. Instead of being rigid, just embrace it, just let it go. Take it, let it flow through you, and then let it pass. What I try to do is just try to be still mm. and understand that things come and go, emotions come and go. The important thing is to accept them all, to embrace them all, and then you can choose to do with them what you want mm. versus being controlled by emotion. You know, a lot of times I've seen players, even myself, you know, when I was younger, being consumed by a particular fear um, and to the point where you're saying, okay, nah, it's it's not good to feel fear. I shouldn't be nervous in this situation, like nah. And it does nothing but grow versus stepping back and saying, yeah, I, I am nervous about the situation. Yeah, I am fearful about the situation. Well, what am I afraid of? And then you kind of unpack it. Mm. And then it gives you the ability to look at it for really what it is, which is nothing more than your imagination <laughs> running its course, you know? Been through toughness really is, um, it's all about not getting too high or getting too low, but just kind of staying, staying pretty even keel. I mean, that's kind of the trick to it is uh, not to get too emotionally attached to the situation. I mean, it's one thing to be excited, but there's certain, certain emotions you got to watch out for, like overlooking plays or getting frustrated because you missed a shot or had a bad turnover and, and kind of letting that kind of linger. Now I think it's a point where um, I can identify it pretty quickly. So if something's frustrating me, I can always I react to it, I can always uh, get right back to you know, the pocket that I need to be in pretty quickly. All right, we settled in. Settled in. Go. The reason why I say that is because we know it's a big game. So a lot of times what happens with your ball club is you start, you get, you get a little too animated. There you go. You get a little too hyped up. And as a result, you start blowing defense assignments, offense assignments. You just become too into the game. And so normally what happens is, is a couple minutes go by and all of a sudden your emotions settle and now you're ready to play the game the right way. Now, I think it's important for athletes to own what it is that they're going through. 
it's awareness, right? I think a lot of times we try to tell children, tell young athletes in particular, um, that if you have those thoughts and those feelings, that's weakness, that's bad, you shouldn't be feeling that, which then causes them to right, feel some type of way about themselves, right? and they carry that around with them for the rest of their lives. And I think the most important thing is for us to be aware of what's going on in here. Not that it's bad, good, or indifferent, but it's awareness. And once you're aware of it, then you can choose to walk hand in hand with it, or you can choose to fight it, but you're making that decision. If you just can constantly bury that in the distance, then it starts festering and it comes up in different ways and manifests itself in different ways. Uh, that's the game. That's the trick of the game, man. Is like, can you, again, detach yourself from it? Can you remove your emotions from the situation? Emotions get in the way a lot, especially in competitive, uh, in competitive uh, situations. that there's two types of players, players who love to win and players who hate to lose. Which one are you? Uh, I'm neither. Meaning? I'm neither. Uh, meaning that, you know, I, I, I play to, to, um, to figure things out. I play to learn something, right? Because I think if you, if you play with, um, with a fear of failure or you play with um, uh, the will to win or that supersedes the fear of failure, I think it's a weakness either way. Right, because if you if you play with the fear, fear of failing, you'll have the pressure on yourself to play, you know, to capitulate to that fear. If you play with the sense of I want to win, I want to win, then you have the fear of what happens if you don't. But if you find common ground in the middle, in the center, then it doesn't matter. You're unfazed by either, right? And that enables you to really just stay in the moment, stay connected to it, and not feel anything other than what's in front of you. So you know, I try to just be dead center. If you fail on Monday. The only way it's a failure on Monday is if you decide to not progress from that, right? So that, so to me, that's why failure is non-existent. Because you know, if I fail today, I, okay, I'm gonna learn something from that failure, and I'm gonna try again on Tuesday. And I fail, and I'm gonna try again on Wednesday. So it doesn't exist. Right. So winning is really how you define what winning is for yourself, and for your team, for your family, right? So you have to know what your values are how you measure success. And then that's all that really matters. At the end of the day, the champion gets a trophy, right? But for us, and for me, when I came in the league, we didn't win right away. There were other teams that won, but I chose to continue to stay focused, continue to learn. So even though I lost by not winning a championship, I won in the long run because I kept on learning. And now here I am with five championships by how the public measures what success is and that's okay but that doesn't drive me what drives me is continuing to learn which is why i'm still sitting here after 18 years determined to come back next year with a vengeance what does losing feel like to you uh it's exciting why is it exciting um because it means you have different um, ways to get better there's certain things that you can figure out that you can take advantage of Right, certain weaknesses that were exposed mm. um, that you need to shore up. Right, so it was exciting. I mean, it, I mean, it sucks to lose, right. but at the same time, there are answers there if you just look at them. Because um, you get the information from losing more than from winning, probably. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the answers are there when you win too. You, 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 you just have to look at them. Yeah. Right. So it's a constant process. It's exciting when you win. It's exciting when you lose because the process should be exactly the same. Whether you win or you lose, is you go back and you look and you find things that you could have done better. You find things that you've done well that worked. You figure out how did they work, why did they work, how can you make them work again. Yeah. And uh, but the hardest thing is to face that stuff. Um, you grow up and you make game-winning shots and it's awesome. You come back the next day and miss a game-winning shot and it's misery. And then the next day comes and you're back playing again and you understand that life has this cyclical nature where it's. You know, what you do on Monday, it's fantastic, but then Tuesday is a bad day. But guess what? There's Wednesday. Yeah. So are we just supposed to live our lives like this the whole time? <laughs> you know, versus just staying like this and understanding that it's really just a journey of evolution every day. It's just constant improvement, constant curiosity, constantly getting better. The results don't really matter. Uh, it's the figuring out 
that matters. Yeah. And if there's a challenge that ensues, oh good, I want to see how I stack up to that. So you go after it, you go after it. And it's just, um, it, it's fun. It's like you get a chance to compete against um, opponents and you get a chance to see where you stack up against them. It's like, I want to see. It, maybe I'm not good enough today, but that, that's fine. I'll be good enough the next time I see you though. You know, and you get a chance to always measure yourself. At 13 years old, you know, I played the longer game because my game wasn't about being better than you at 13. It was to be better than you when, you know, the chips are really on, on the line. So when we played at 13, I would size you up and see what your strengths and weaknesses are. How do you approach the game? Are you silly about it? Are you goofy about it? Are you good at it just because you're bigger and stronger than everybody else? Right? Or is there actually thought and skill that you put into it? Right? And when I'd play, I'd play to my weaknesses. I wouldn't play to my strengths. I'd play to my weaknesses. Because when you're playing summer basketball, there's so many games. So there's not a lot of skill work being done. So when are you going to get better? Right? When you're playing in competition situations, you're only playing to your strengths. Why? Because you want to win. Right? So what I would do, I always work on the things during those games that I was weak at. Left hand, pull up jump shot, uh, post game. Right? So I have a strategy. And so then fast forward to when I'm 17 and my game is completely well rounded and that player at 13 that I saw at 13 is still doing the same shit at 17. Mm -hmm. Now you got a problem. Right? And so it's always um, um, that competitive nature, the work ethic and curiosity because I asked a lot of questions. You know, playing with Byron Scott, I asked him a lot of questions. Eddie Jones, who was great at chasing guards off the screens, and I didn't understand how to do that. I would sit with him before practice, after practice. Um, Magic, um, James Worthy, Kurt Rambis, Kareem Abdul, all the Laker greats, I would always sit down and just ask him questions about certain games that I studied growing up. What actually happened there? What did you feel there? Why? You know, bird tough to defend, why? Because he looks slow as shit to me. So he's like, <laughs> I'm, I'm like, I'm missing something. So like, tell me what I'm missing, you know what I mean? And so I would always ask questions and try to learn as much as I could. It's a good separation for me, you know, emotionally, to be able to put myself in a place where at practice or when I'm training or during games, I switch my mind to something else. I switch my mode into something else, right? For me, it's the equivalent of Maximus, Desmus, Meridius, and Gladiator picking up the dirt, smelling the dirt, it's go time, right? So that was my mental switch. It was like an actor getting ready for a film. You gotta put yourself in that cage. When you're in that cage, you are that character. And then when you leave there, it's something completely different. But when I'm in that cage, bro, don't fucking touch me. Don't talk to me. <laughs> I had to separate myself. Because going through that, that time, I felt like there's so many things coming at once. It was just becoming very, very confusing. I had to organize things. So I created the Black Mamba. So Kobe has to deal with these issues, and the, um, all the personal challenges. The Black Mamba steps on the court and does what he does. That's it. Be you. Be you. There's no gimmick. There's no, you don't have to contrive anything. Who are you? Where are you today? What is your story? Where does that come from? Right? And then all you're doing is not communicating the story to the public. I tell you, like when, we, when I was in high school, um, and uh, I used to work out with the 76ers, I used to ask him, you know, what's it like to guard Mike? You know, Mike? You mean black Jesus? I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> black who? Oh, we call him black Jesus. Or you can call him black cat. I'm like, I'm gonna call him fucking Mike. That's his fucking name. So the level of fear that he inspired in others was insane. Wow. And I would tell him, I said, when I face him, we're gonna go at it. He says, oh, you don't wanna do that. I'm like, what? Man, you don't know me, man. And so when we matched up, I think he understood that. And, you know, when I was 18, my first year, he got the best of me a bunch of times. I was right there the next play. You're not intimidating me. Yeah. I'm not going anywhere. And I think he saw that level of respect because I think he was the same way at 18 years old. And 
that common bond is, is what I think, uh, you know, where our connection was built. I Can I just ask a question? Jeez. Three titles, could be a fourth in a matter of weeks, league MVP, could be finals MVP, and by the way, you go and win the gold this summer, only one other person has done all of those things in one season, which is Michael Jordan. How are you going to get mad at that comparison? I'm not mad at it. You're talking about the greatest that ever played the game. Okay. Come on. I mean, let, let, just let me do me. Right. <laughs> just let me do me. But does not Kobe want to be the greatest? Yeah, I want to be compared with Michael Jordan. But don't you want to be the greatest? I want to be the best I can be. You understand what I'm saying? Like, Mike, Michael is Michael. He, and I've learned so much from him. And he and I always talk. I could pick up the phone and call him. And he's always there for me. And, um... Which, uh, but you gotta let me be me. <laughs> you know, this is we're we're different, different people. Now, at that point, was that when the Black Mamba raised its head? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or was identified? Well, it, it was always there. It was always there. It was always there. It just identified. Know, let's put a name to it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, tell me about that. Well, I mean, like I said, it, it's it's it, there's a difference between who you are and what you are. And what I am when I step on that court is, you know, I become that. You know, I, I am, I am that killer snake. You know, and I'm stone cold, man. Clyde dribbling, has to put it up with the buzzer. Ha-ha! He backs in the three, and the Lakers win the game. Of all your nicknames, which one is your favorite and why? <laughs> Like Mamba, Vino. Um, I like right now. I, I like I like Vino right. You now. like Vino right now? I like Vino. Vino right is now. a great nickname. Yeah, Black Black Mamba's like you know that I, I I enjoy that obviously. And that's that's the that's the alter ego that I turn into when I step on the court. I can't remember where this was. You mentioned you studied actors to get mindset. It was kind yeah. of a throwaway line, but I'm wondering who you studied the most. Like who are you watching? You're like. I love that cold ass shit from whoever in this movie. Um, Hilary Swank and I had a lot of conversations about that actually, and um, uh, talked to Kate Winslet about it as well. Um, but we we really got into how they build their characters and how they get into character. Uh, I've spoken with Larry Moss about that process mm -hmm. as well, and there's something to that because, like, as an actor, you are trained to get into that zone, find that pocket. And as athletes, the psychology is the same. You know, the, 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 the Sean Penn as well, we had a great conversation about it as well. Um, the discipline is different, but the behavior is the same. Before you start a game, how can you lock in and get into that mental space where nothing else matters? You're completely locked in and focused on what you're trying to accomplish as an athlete out here. The noise of the crowd doesn't matter. Whether the cheering or booing doesn't matter. You're just completely locked in. How do you do that? As a kid, I said, I want to be the best ever, right? And now you go through your life and everything you do is try to be the best ever, be the best ever, be the best ever. And as you get older, you start understanding that those things are very superficial things, right? And everybody has a different opinion about it. No matter what you do, I can win 20 championships. There's always an opinion on who's the best. Everybody has different opinions. And so I started really kind of understanding, maybe that's not the important thing. Maybe the important thing is to, you know, how do we as a team grow? How do I help my teammates be better? So that was the first change for me. And then as I got older still, it became more about um, how are you inspiring others, right, to find themselves. That is the ultimate championship. So uh, won five championships, that's great. Another team won a championship this year. Team's gonna win a championship next year. Those things come and they go. But what stays is how do you use your passion and use that to inspire somebody else to create their passion and then how can they pass that on to the next person? That is true success. Phil would come to me and say, there was a year there in 03 where I had 40 points in nine straight games, right? Shaq was out, it was a toe thing. So Phil comes to me before the stress says, Kobe, we need you to take over the offense. I'm like, all right, cool. So that literally- Say no more. I got it, <laughs> fine, I got it. So that literally started the streak. 40 straight game, you know, 40 points in nine straight games. Shaq comes back from injury and Phil goes, you know, I still continue to do it, right? And then Phil calls me to his office, goes, hey, you know, we're starting to lose the big fella. What do you mean? Well, he's not, 
getting the attention. You know, this this 40 point streak is starting to kind of take away his fire mm. to prove something, right? So I need you to start dialing it back. I'm like, what? <laughs> he says, we're gonna lose him and we need him in June. Okay, all right. You have a game against the Clippers. I think I like 38 or something like that. And I had a chance to score 40 and to get 40 again. It was a blowout game. I dumped the ball in the shack instead of shooting a wide open shot. The 40 point streak ended that night. Wow. That was it. And that's inside stuff that people don't know. Right. <laughs> and so you just, tell me you went to Phil's office and said, are you happy yes. now? Yeah. Because Phil was like, hey, we got to dial it back. We got to dial it back. We're you starting to lose the big fella. Perfect Kobe, too. You're like, he's like, you got to dial it back. You're like, all right, I'll score 38 instead of 40. <laughs> well, I mean, this is the streak thing. I would, yeah. It would have been 10 in a row. would have right. broke a record. Right. Wow. Right. Right. I would have broke the record, but instead. So on team buses, team planes, in a locker room, after practice, I would look at the film. I'd pull Powell, Lamar, D. Fish pull them aside and say, let's look at this, right? We probably should have done this, that, and the other. So you'll show them the game from a little yeah, bit here and there. Yeah, and then you speak to them in, in executional terms. It's never, come on, guys, we can do better. Come on, guys, we can do better. That's rah-rah stuff, right? A leader must give very tactical you know, uh, things that we can do, adjustments. Okay, the defense is doing this, that, and the other. That means we should probably do this, 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 that, and the other. Yeah. By midway through the season, through that behavior, you start seeing them communicating the same way back to you, right? And it's wow. like, okay, Cole, they're doing this, that, and the other to you. Maybe we should do this, that, and the other. You're like, okay, yeah, oh, yeah. awesome, <laughs> great, let's do it. Yeah, yeah. When I was playing, what I would do is, is um, study the film, but study our younger players mm. and see what areas do they need to develop in and how can I help them develop? I mean, that was, that was the big challenge is you move from, you know, um, uh, being the single dominant player yeah. to understanding, okay, I have to help these other guys. How do I lift everyone else up? It's tough. The reason why I did that is because I know San Antonio is not going to leave me. Bruce is not going to take his body off of me. So that's a great opportunity to get somebody else involved, to get somebody else a really good shot, especially Derek. And it's important for him to get a good rhythm. Parker flips it. You gonna create that momentum though. So Phil wants me to take that shot, but I'm seeing, you know, if this winds up being a close game, uh, I'd rather save that right. shot for the fourth quarter right. and continue to punish them with my teammates and with power rolling to the basket. If he doesn't have it, you got another shooter coming up that'll have it. Hey, fish! Hit me on the pitch. Come off. I'm gonna hit him coming off that double four three. Now, the reason why I do that is because I want Ramonovich to get going. It's important because he's such a great shooter. I want to get him a look. I feel like he's not a part of this game yet, and, I, and it's important that I that I make him a part of that. So I know I can be a decoy on that strong side, and we can get him coming up for a three on the, on the weak side. And this is what I couldn't do years ago because I, I, I didn't have the personnel on my team that I have now. See, in the past, I would have to, you know, score 35, 40 points just to keep us competitive. Now, I don't have to do that. So you see me, you know, directing more so than anything. Yeah, I'm more of a compass, making sure we're going in the right direction, making sure we're executing well, because I have the personnel to be able to do that now. Doka is fouled. It's made my life a lot easier. I'm still capable of having big score nights, but I just don't have to do it. That's reverse action. Every team in the league knows what this is. You know, this is me just basically coming up uh, to the top of the key or the elbow area and, uh, and making a play. It's either isolation or, you know, we go to the drop right here and I'll clear them out. And we got someone on the weak side. Here we go. Fisher, that's a three. Because, you know, they know that's coming. So they think I'm going to isolate and go one-on-one. -on -one. So as a result, they got to have help defense. And when they have help defense, I know I got to shoot them. San Antonio still looking for their coming, first coming. field goal of the third quarter and we're almost halfway through. And before, you know, that wasn't Derek Fisher, so I, I'd have to <laughs> I'd have to go one on two. <laughs> but now, yeah, I can make, just make the defense pay. If they want to leave me, I'm going to hit Derek. Derek's going to knock it down. Fisher pulls up. He's feeling it. Fish. See, now he's in a great rhythm. We're a better team because we got Powell going, Lamar's going, Ooh. D. Fish is going. Oh, shot. And so, you know, now what, what is the defense going to do? Are they going to stay at home with these guys? And then that's when I get going. Understanding empathy and compassion. Right? Because as, as a young kid, when I came in the league, it was like, I'm driving this way, and either you're going to be on the train or be on the track. 
right? It, there was no such thing as understanding that people have lives outside of the game, <laughs> which, which you know, I, apparently I did not. Um, but like if I understood that at an early age, and I, it, it helps me as a leader to communicate better. I came to understand that later um, and um, getting to know people on a personal level. Um, what are their fears? What are their insecurities? Right? What are their dreams and ambitions, desires, those sorts of things? When you come to understand that about a person, then you can help them reach the best version of themselves. So I wish I'd known that earlier. Phil said, wrote that you were, um, he said that your philosophy was give me the damn ball, but at a certain point, you, that changed. You started taking your teammates to dinner. You started socializing with them and treating them like partners. Was, was that a conscious decision you made, or did that yeah, just happen? It was, it, was, it was part of the evolution of understanding um, you know, what it takes to enhance the group around you. You know, I was a person that was completely consumed with my craft. And, and you know, I, I got to a point in my career where I had to kind of take a step back and start looking outwardly and not looking, you know, internally of how to make improvements, but start looking at others and saying, okay, how can I make him better? How can I improve him? What's he going through, et cetera, et cetera. And that, you know, that, w that came from, you know, Phil's direction. Um, I, I think the definition of greatness is to inspire the people next to you. Yeah, I, I think that's what greatness is or should be. It's, it's not something that's, that, that lives and dies with one person. Mm. It's how can you inspire a person to then in turn inspire another person that yeah. then inspires another person. And that's how you create something that I think lasts forever. Yeah. And uh, I think that's our challenge as people is to, um, is to figure out how our story can impact others and mm. motivate them in a way to create their own greatness. What does the MVP mean to you? I think what's special about this season is that, you know, I felt like we were such a community. We we're such a great team. We all got along. I felt like it was an award that we shared together. Nice move from Farmer. Which made it more special because I felt like we did it, you know, because they made me better. Keep it going, Jordan. By them, Keep you know, going. getting in the gym, Keep working on their game and making plays and making Duncan. shots, that in turn brought me the MVP. Duncan. There Double. you go. There Get you the go. banker. Walk the rebound. There you go. You know, in the past, you know, I hear a lot of my fans saying that I should have won it before. And maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Hold him to the follow. But winning the MVP was, uh, you know, it, it was a great honor because it was something that we shared together as a unit. I was, I think I was born to play, man. I started playing at like two years old. And my father wasn't one of these fathers that was like, you're going to play basketball, or, you know. He wasn't one of those guys. It was just kind of, I was just around the game a lot. And uh, I gravitated to the ball and I was completely geeking out about like the smell of the ball and like the way it sounds when it hits concrete versus how it hits a parquet floor and like the sound of the nets and the different material of the nets. and. You know, there's certain basketball hoops, like in high school gyms and in college gyms, the rim sits slightly above the, the lower part of the backboard. And it was like, I was geeking out if I got into a gym which was like the NBA with the lower stanchion of the backboard and the, um, and the hoop were completely parallel with each other. Like, I, like little shit like that would freak me out. Like I, so to answer your question, I was born to do this thing, man. And, and I did it um, nonstop, all day long, um, from the age of two to, when I retired, man. I love playing basketball. There's nothing like it. What is it you love? <sighs> this is the ball when it bounces, the sound that it makes, the smell of the basketball, the nets when you, when you shoot the ball and it goes right through the net. The sneakers as they squeak on the wood. The strategies, uh, the competition, the camaraderie. The fans, uh, we just go on and on and on. I think it's just finding what it is that you love to do. Like I, 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 didn't, I don't feel like I worked a day in my life. You know, it's not, it wasn't, it's hard work as it's defined by the world. But to me, there was no place I'd rather be. Like you can't, like I'd rather not be anywhere. I'd rather be on the track at four in the morning running wind sprints and, you know, then be in a weight room at six and then be on the court at nine and then, you know, train till three and then be back. You know, like I'd rather be doing that than anything else. So it wasn't like it was hard work. It's, I just found what it is that I love to do. Uh, probably different for me than most because it was, uh, 
It's what I truly wanted to do. It's what I enjoyed doing. So it wasn't like I was, I didn't feel like I was giving something up. I felt like I was gaining something because I enjoyed, I enjoyed playing. You know, things are never perfect. Yeah. But through love, you continue to persevere and you mm -hmm. move through them. You move through them. And then through that storm, beautiful sun emerges. Yeah. Right? And inevitably another storm comes. And guess what? You ride that one out too. Yeah. So I think love is a certain determination and persistence to go through the good times and the bad times with the someone or something uh, that you truly love. Mm. Well, no, I mean, it's, it's, you know, that's the trick, isn't it? It's, it's finding what you love to do. I mean, we talk about hard work all the time. It's like, you know, man, if you gotta get up every single morning and remind yourself how hard you need to work, you probably need to choose a different profession, you know? Because that shouldn't be there. Like, I wake up in the morning excited to get to it. You know, if I'm not training, I'm missing it. If I'm not watching a game of basketball, I miss it. I, you know, there's no place I'd rather be. And if you have that feeling, then you're truly doing what God has put you on this earth to do. At, at what age did that goal become crystal clear? That I, made, I made that deal with myself at 13 years old. At 13 years 13 old? 13 years old. That's the you deal I made. You were crystal clear about it? Crystal clear. And where did inspiration come from? Um, the love of the game. The love of the game. The challenge. Like, I, I would watch Magic play. I'd watch Michael play. And I would see them do these unbelievable things. And I'd say, you know, can I get to that level? I don't know, but let's find out. Players oftentimes, they lose that passion, right? They're playing for economic stability. Sure. They show up and they're like, oh, for the first time in my life, I can go to Vegas and be and ball out and sure. be popular and famous. And I'm sure. gonna enjoy that. How do you stay hungry? Because you might've had that situation too. I mean, you could just as easily have gone down that road, but you didn't. I, I, didn't, I didn't enjoy it. You didn't enjoy no, it. No, I enjoyed playing basketball. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I, you know, and when I say that, uh, people tend to have a tendency to take that lightly. Yeah. But no, I love the game. I love it. Right. I didn't want to be away from it. I wanted to play all the time. Like a lot of guys have fun hanging out in the pool in Vegas, and that's that's it's fine. It's a time and place for that, right? But like. When I was 18, 20, 21 years old, I wanted to play basketball. I was consumed with this quest of trying to be the best, you know, and we weren't there yet. I had to, there's so many things I had to figure out. Like, am I training properly? Am I working on the right things on the court? There's so many things to do. I didn't have time to go and, you know, hang out over here, so. If you're using, let's say, Shaq as competitive fuel on the court, who are you using for competitive fuel in your business now? Do you have that same? I, I, never, I never use others for competitive fuel. Like, I, I would only do that for that extra, like, 2% at the end. Mm -hmm. You know, like, the other 98% came from within. It just came from, like, the, 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 the love of, of playing and the love of figuring things out. And so that's what I do here. Like, it's the love of creating something. And I'm really excited because I feel like we're creating something new. Like the, the world does not have stories like this. We do not have... Uh, sports fantasy stories. We don't have those. And so I become very excited about getting those out into the market. If I had the power to turn back time, I would never use it. I don't think about it. Because then every moment that you go through means absolutely nothing, but you can always go back and do it again. So it loses its flavor, it it's loses its, its beauty. When things are final, you know, moments won't ever come again. Well, what I found out is that the game of basketball has really been a great teacher of life uh, as far as um, unending challenges, uh, teamwork, you know, doing things together. Getting along. Getting along, learning the ups and downs uh, of a season and, you know, enjoying the journey of the season and it's really helped me mature. Uh, I've heard Michael use that quote before and I've heard Magic use the quote before. Uh, saying how the game has really been a teacher of life for them. And um, a couple of years ago, I really didn't understand what they were talking about. I, I couldn't see that. Um, but now I, I, can, I can definitely say the same thing. If you finished your career without a championship, you would not have looked at that as a failure. No, I would have looked at it as being extremely disappointed because I had a dream and I had goals that I wanted to accomplish, right? 
And if I don't accomplish those goals, I have to ask myself why, right? If so, so for my pos um, position, the reason why I would not have accomplished those things is um, poor leadership, um, failure to communicate properly with my teammates to put them in positions to be successful, um, lack of preparation, you know, all those things would be reasons why I don't win, right? So now, if that was the case, in my career, I have to sit and I have to analyze that. And then as I move and I evolve, you know, post-basketball into business or whatever, those same weaknesses are going to reveal themselves there, right? So if I don't learn from that, I'm going, I'm going to struggle here too, right? So I can take those situations and learn from those and have them, you know, uh, make me a better person later in life. But if I don't take that stuff and apply that someplace else, then that is, that's failing, which to me is the, the worst possible thing you could ever have is to stop and to not learn. Well, I Max, mean, I think the greatest fear that we face is ourselves, actually. You know, I think it's, uh, it's not anything that's external or anything that's superficial. I think the greatest fear you face is yourself I mean, because you know, we all have dreams, and it's very scary sometimes to accept the dream that you have. And it's scarier still to say, okay, I want that. It's scary because you're afraid that if you put your heart and soul into it and you fail, then how are you going to feel about yourself, right? So being fearless means putting yourself out there and going for it, no matter what, go for it. Not for anybody else. But for yourself, you know, sports is the greatest, greatest metaphor we have in terms of dealing with life. Because, you know, even if you listen to music, music will give you guidance, mm -hmm. right? That you can then meditate on and think about how you would apply it. In sports, you have to apply it in the here and now. I mean, you're faced with challenges moment to moment. You're faced with pressures and anxiety and communication or the lack thereof and all this other stuff. Like, it's in the moment. So you have to live it. And when you practice those things, you become better at it. Even now that I'm retired, you know, I, I, everything that I've learned from the game of basketball, I've carried it over into life. Mm -hmm. You know, like basketball has helped me be a better person, a better friend, a better How father. So? Well, because there's life lessons that are within the game, mm -hmm. like communication, like unselfishness, um, like attention to detail and um, empathy and compassion. Like all those things are in the game. And uh, as an athlete, if we are aware of those things, mm -hmm. It helps us become better human human beings. Did last year at any point with you going through your first season not yeah. playing basketball? Never. Not once did you Never. think about it? Never. Here's the thing is for us athletes, it's really hard to transition from that, right? And I was really personal about it when I wrote Dear Basketball. But that is the true challenge of finding what comes next and finding something that you love to do every bit as much as you love your first passion. That is the challenge for us. And I think. Unfortunately for us athletes, we've been pigeonholed into thinking that we can only be one thing. And so when I retire and everybody is saying, okay, he's too competitive, he's not gonna know what to do with himself. He's gonna have to come back. I took that as a personal challenge of them thinking I'm this one dimensional person. that All I know is how to dribble a ball, shoot the ball and play basketball and compete at that level. And so I took that as a personal challenge. I will never come back to the game, ever. I'm here to show people that we can do much more than that. And creating this business, winning an Oscar, winning the Emmy, and the Annie, those are things that are showing other athletes that come after you. No, no, there's more to this thing. I think it's how do you negotiate with yourself. I think that's the biggest thing. Is uh, and we talk about the mental side of it, but then like, what does that really mean? Like the thoughts that happen in your mind when you're going through a competitive situation, or you're facing a tight deadline, you still don't have the idea yet. You know what happens inside of here? You talk yourself out of it. You say, okay, well, it won't be a big deal if I don't do it, or I don't have to get up on a Tuesday morning to go ahead and hit the track. What does this day really mean in the long scheme of things anyway? It's just one day. Mm -hmm. And when you have those conversations with yourself, are you able to negotiate your way out of, you know, that little you know, voice telling you it's not that important, or does that little voice get the best of you? I think that's what separates people who are going to do great things versus people who don't, or people that do great things, but in an inconsistent way. You said, uh, I read a quote that you said you love business as much as basketball. There's yeah. no way that's true. It's a hundred percent true. You, there's no way you love, I mean, basketball was your life, you, your passion. 
everything. You, you're telling me you love doing business as much. If you could, you know, basically snap a finger and be 25 year old Kobe or the Kobe today, you wouldn't go back and, and keep playing basketball? No, because I've already done it. See, here's the thing. When, when I was playing and, you know, teammates would say, oh, Kobe's not out on the road. What is he doing? You see me on the plane, he's reading. What is he reading? He's writing. What is he writing? Mm -hmm. I'm practicing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm writing. I'm practicing. I'm understanding how to tell stories. I'm reading Joseph Campbell and how to create arcs, compelling arcs and plots. I'm reading that stuff. So this is going back 15 years, right? So I don't just retire, write dear basketball and luck into winning an Oscar. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That stuff comes from hard work and from studying for 15 years how to write and how to organize structure. Right. And you can't do that without having a serious love or commitment to the craft. I sometimes forget that I played basketball in the major leagues for, yeah. I mean, baseball for 23 years yeah. because I'm so excited in the moment. Yeah. The present. yeah. That yeah. sounds really weird to people. <laughs> right. <laughs> they think you know we're I mean? lying. It does. It's really I weird. feel like you're How lying. How is that possible? You, you, there's no way, man. Like, you know, like I remember I said, um, I told somebody, I said, listen, if what I do in the next 20 years, is not better than my last 20, then I failed. And I'm mm -hmm. like, well, that's disrespectful to what you've done the last 20 <laughs> years. How could you say, my man, I wouldn't accomplish what I accomplished my last 20 years if I did not have this mentality to begin with. So mm -hmm. the kids are running. They've been running for two hours, running, running, running. This one kid misses the line by like half inch. No, it wasn't even half inch. It was like about that much. <laughs> yeah, was like, he misses the line. That. Kobe's like, stop, 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 stop. We had to stop. We had to stop everything. And he's like, nobody gets shoes. And all these kids are like, oh, they're mad at the kid. Yeah. They're like, touch the line. All you gotta do is touch the line. That's it. It was this much. Touch the line. And and you know, Kobe's like, no, nobody, nobody gets shoes. You guys sit on the sideline. And then Kobe made this kid run suicides, which is another drill. Baseline, free throw line, baseline, half court, baseline, opposite free throw line, baseline, baseline, and back. Three in a row. Three times. <laughs> you had to run three of them. Yeah. But, but the, the best message... part was, oh. the best part was, uh, the last one, Kobe ran with this kid. He ran with this kid. Okay. Yeah. It's awesome. He ran with this kid. and There's 1.1 mil million people are watching online. Crazy. He ran with this kid. This kid was dry heaving. He was about to die. Yeah. But you you're know, lucky he didn't die. No, he's, he wasn't going to die. He wasn't going to die. <laughs> but but the, the important thing to understand is you can't, you can't shortchange yourself. Like, you're, not, you're not cheating anybody but yourself. Right? I mean, you're tired. You're literally this far away from the line. Why would you not go that extra to touch the line? Right? So if I let him get away with that, right, all of a sudden he starts maybe a cheat something over here. Right? Not give his best over here. Not give his best over here. And as years go on, he's going to be extremely, he's not going to reach his full potential because he's been taking these little shortcuts that just add up, add up, add up, add up, add up. And you can't let that happen. Our, our job as teachers, as mentors, as inspirers, it's our responsibility to hold them accountable to those things. If we have a project and you're saying, okay, I can do that, that's not the project we want. The projects that say, I don't know if I can animate that. I don't know how to write that story. I don't know how to do that. Those are the things we want because through that curiosity, you'll reach a level that you didn't think was possible. Mm -hmm. And so running the studio, that's what I'm doing. And the, the whole idea is that, you know, when I started playing the game, everything was about trying to be the best win this many, you know, win as many championships as you can, yada, 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 yada. You get older, you start to understand that really it's about the next generation, that these championships do come and go, right? And there'll be other people that win championships, but the most important thing you can do is to pay everything that you've learned forward to, to the next generation to come. And that's truly how you create something that lasts forever. My kids, volleyball, um, basketball, schoolwork, they work every day. And that's how you instill it in them, where it becomes a behavioral thing. And it doesn't matter what they decide to do. Like if Gianna decides to not play basketball when she grows up, that's fine. But she understands the discipline that it takes to work at something every single day. So whether she wants to be a writer, a director, a doctor, a lawyer, she'll have those characteristics. 
I think curiosity is the most important thing. Like you, you, you have to be infinitely curious about things and pursue things that you really enjoy. You know, despite what others may say. So, you know, I'll give you an example. During my last year of playing, I would get the question all the time from other players, from media people, like pull me aside, and, and they would be genuinely concerned. Like, okay, what are you going to do when you retire? Like, what, like we're concerned about you because you're so competitive and so focused on basketball. What are you going to do next? And I'd say, well, I'm going to I'm going to be a storyteller. And they just kind of pat me on the shoulder and say, okay, yeah, that's cute. So here's what's going to happen. You're going to retire. You're going to go through a state of depression. I'm like, no, I, like I figured out what I'm going to do. No, storytelling, that's not a real thing, right? But I got that a lot. And if I, if I didn't learn from the game, I would have allowed that reaction from people to deter me from what it is that I was doing. And it could have completely pushed me in another direction. But instead, I stayed focused on it. I remained determined, and I believed in it, and I pushed forward. And, uh, and lastly, our daughters, Natalia, Gianna, and Bianca. Um, you know, I, 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 I hope that tonight is not, you know, you guys know that, you know, if you do the work, you work hard enough, dreams come true. You know that, we all know that. But hopefully what you get from tonight is the understanding that, um, those times when you get up early and you work hard, those times when you stay up late and you work hard, those times when you don't feel like working, you're too tired, you don't want to push yourself, but you do it anyway. Um, that is actually the dream. You know, when you have a dream as a kid to say, okay, I want to play in the NBA, sometimes it feels like the worst thing you can do is actually share that dream with other kids and other people um, because they have a way of kind of uh, um, uh, talking reality into you and saying, okay, you have to have perspective. Um, not a lot of people make that, let alone some kid that's playing basketball in Italy is going to make it to the NBA and do all this sort of stuff. So um, the, the, the biggest challenge, I think, is, is believing in your dream and not losing that childlike innocence and quality to be able to have these big dreams and go after it because it can be done. It's just unfortunate that there are some people in the world that don't believe that they can achieve those dreams. And so they try to talk you out of your own. So that, that is a really, really big challenge that I faced as a kid, as I faced in the NBA, and as I continue to face now. I hope people appreciate what we've seen from Kobe Bryant. It's been fun. It's been amazing playing against this younger generation, seeing them grow up after all these years. And uh, I guess it's a wrap. I see you when I see you. Kobe Bryant, one of the greatest players to play the game. Because there will never, ever be another Kobe Bryant. Mamba out.